Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the forum. It's so good to see all of you here today. Um, we have uh, been receiving a lot of coronavirus alerts from the city, and so um, I, we really didn't know how many people were going to be here today. So it's especially good that you were able to make it today. So we're very grateful to see you. Every year, Grace Cathedral chooses a theme, and our theme this year is bridges. Um, how do we build bridges between different societies? How do we do br bridges between people of different races and religions? Um, and even how do we build bridges and seek reconciliation in our personal relationships, too? So um, everyone ha you know, has, has to do that work of forgiveness, and, and, and how do we do that? And um, one of the best examples of bi bridge building I can think of is our guest today, who um, has been building bridges between the Christian church and um, the, the Muslim faith, um, building bridges uh, in Israel and Palestine, um, and bu building bridges um, pretty much everywhere he goes. It might mean, you know, if he had a Latin subtitle, it would have the word bridges in it somewhere. One of the most painful and complicated divides of our time lies between the states of Israel and Palestine, and maybe a good place to start is to look at the narratives that each tell about themselves and, our, and each other. Our guest today is co-founder and professor of Islamic law and theology at Zaytuna College, the first accredited Muslim liberal arts college in the United States. He is a senior lecturer in the Department of Near Eastern and Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, and he's the author of Palestine, It is Something Colonial. Colonial. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hatem Bazian. Thank you for joining us today. Very glad to see you. Thank you. You know, I wonder if you can start just by um, talking to us a little bit about what Palestine is and, and who are Palestinians. Well, that's a, <laughs> it's a big topic. It's a big topic. <laughs> And that'll uh, be my last question. <laughs> well, uh, Palestine, uh, if we think about history and those who work in archaeology, those who work on uh, historical studies, Palestine is one of the oldest places on earth. Uh, uh, civilization begins in three or four areas in the world, whether it's Palestine, Mesopotamia, Iraq, the Nile Valley, uh, India, China area. Uh, so Palestine, at least in terms of recorded history from archaeological work, we have about 40,000 to 60,000 years of material history from archaeologists. Mm. Uh, the oldest uh, community that is mentioned textually are the Canaanites. Right. Uh, so if you speak to archaeologists, they say every time we dig some place in Palestine, uh, a Canaanite comes jumping at us. <laughs> uh, uh, in the biblical text, again using it as a historical reference, uh, Abraham uh, uh, left Mesopotamia and seek refuge in Palestine, in the land of the Canaanites, and I tend to say that they gave him the green card, <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't build walls to keep people out. Right. Uh, so he actually came to the land of the Canaanites, and it says that he met the king of uh, Jerusalem at the time, uh, uh, and then he actually spoke the language of the Canaanites, the reference that he felt as an outsider or an alien in the land of the Canaanites. So the earliest historical written record in relations to Palestine mentions that Abraham actually came to a land that is already inhabited, had a society, a civilization, had a king, and also when we think about the purchase of a grave for his family in okay. Al-Khalil or Hebron, he actually paid for the plot of land, similar to what we do these days, more expensive, but right. <laughs> uh, which means that there are already a rate of exchange in the society. So if we, from that, we deduce that one of the critical elements of any development of society is the control of currency, not to mention the Federal Reserve reducing the interest right, rate. Exactly. So meaning that there were already a very well-developed society in there. So if we say that Palestine, the oldest reference is the Canaanites, but then almost every other uh, civilization and power laid or attempted to lay claim to Palestine at one way or the other, but the, definitely the imprint of the society is still Canaanite in nature. Yeah, that's so interesting. I wonder when you were a child and you were growing up, just how you came to consciousness of just, you know, what, what, what that story and, and, and just the emerging story that was happening around you too. Well, uh, again, my family is originally from the city of Nablus, mm. which... Again, the Old Testament, the Bible is Shekim, uh, 
right? And we know that uh, uh, my father's side is from Naples, my mother's side is from Jerusalem. So literally you're talking about two uh, old cities that uh, if you walk around, you're just confronted with the material history in there from the buildings to the streets uh, to the various expressions of the society. Uh, one time, if you just look at the dresses that Palestinian women uh, wear, it's actually written on it uh, parts of the history of the society because these are dresses that uh, are sewn over a period of time. It's often traditionally that when somebody is getting married that the family actually works on this uh, outfit to gift it and it becomes part of the treasure that is kept in relation to society. So that's part of the consciousness of what your experience walking in Jerusalem or walking in uh, Nablus, uh, you could actually experience history as a living history. Uh, yeah. I, I can, can imagine even like the, 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 the city plan, like where the streets are laid out and how they're oriented. Is, yeah, uh, I tend to say the following, that uh, when uh, I took uh, in my early classes uh, American history, I said I don't like current issues. Uh, <laughs> because my grandfather's store in the city of Nablus is 800 years old. <laughs> uh, so literally my own grandfather's house yeah. uh, is almost three and a half times as old as the United States. Right, uh, right. Not to you know, downplay it, because the, the United States history is also uh, engages in the erasure of Native American history. Yes, exactly. So I'm very well aware that we're all living here on the stolen land of the Ohlone people. Yeah. And I teach at a university that still holds the bones of Native Americans. Right, so those exactly. are the contradictions yeah. that you have to engage in as you're aware, both in speaking about your own history, but also speaking about the history of this country as well. Yeah, definitely. When your parents talked to you as a child, like what did they say about um, you know, the relation between um, Israelis and Palestinians? Like, What, what was their take on, on, on what was happening? Well. For again, for Palestinians, we always have to face the erasure. Yeah. So, for example, my father, uh, we left Palestine. We had to move to Jordan. Uh, so, both the death of my grandfather uh, and my grandmother, my father could not travel to attend uh, the, the funeral of yeah. my father, uh, my grandfather, and my grandmother. And mm -hmm. same on my mother's side. Uh, she could not uh, at least attend because the time period to get a permit to travel, uh, the crossing of the bridge, speaking about bridges yeah. from Jordan to Palestine is very difficult. My own experience of the first time to encounter an Israeli was actually encountering a, an Israeli soldier on the, on the crossing with my mother. Uh -huh. And uh, at the time I was uh, six years old. If, uh, and literally, my mother had to be stripped to her underwear with my presence being there and being searched with a metal detector on the border. Yeah. So for me, the relationship has been at least defined through these uh, uh, relationships where you could actually see the process of humiliation and the erasure yeah. uh, for a long period of time. To say, I am from Palestine is a political statement because on the Israeli side, you don't exist. Yeah. And therefore, uh, to experience that and simultaneously say there is no such thing as a Palestinian, that becomes part of your consciousness. And then to also go through the process that you're a stateless person. Right, right, right? exactly. Uh, uh, and that always have to be confronted. For example, if you're from Gaza, you're a stateless person. Just to be able to get out of Gaza, uh, you have to go through the whole structure of the United Nations just to go and get out of Gaza to be able to study uh, or to be able to, uh, you know, get married. Or, and I know actually individuals who their marriage happened, they were able to, to go through the tunnels to uh, talk about what you call not runaway bride, but actually uh, sneaking the bride in or yeah. the groom. Literally, they actually had to come through the tunnels in order to get the marriage taken place, right. uh, and then uh, after that, they actually had to come out through the tunnels to travel. And I know the person, they're right here in, in Massachusetts area. Right, right. Uh, so that's the experience of terms of Palestine, Israel, and how both the uh, experiences, the traumatic experiences, but also the erasure that you face, and it's global in nature. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yesterday I was in a different uh, lecture, uh, which was the... Uh, Islamophobia and the challenge to Muslim charities. Mm -hmm. And 
if you're going to send money back home to Palestine, uh, you have to go through uh, layers and layers because one, within the banking system, uh, you cannot transfer to a country that is not recognized. Right, right. So how to do that if there is already a regime that regulates uh, the basic transfer of money? So you have to find ways to, pa to transfer money to your family. Uh, and if you're going to send help and support to... Uh, Palestinians, you have to go through a variety of different uh, ways just to be able to do that. Right. Uh, so you don't even have to be in Palestine to experience the right, exactly. restrictions, disconnection and the disconnections the and the boundaries that are set around Palestine. Right, exactly. I, I wonder, just like as a teenager, were you angry about this? Or, or, or did you just kind of take it for granted that this is the way things were in the world? Or like, how did you come to consciousness that, you know, just about colonialism and in a more like, I don't know, more an intellectual way? Well, uh, I think for uh, the Southern Hemisphere in general, uh, Consciousness of the political is always there. Yeah. Uh, consciousness of colonization is always there. Uh, for me, most likely, I spent more time reading about Martin Luther King, MLK, the Black Panther Party, uh, movements in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, yeah. in uh, Zaire, South Africa, uh, much more than possibly thinking of the work of Dante and uh, right, right. reading Rousseau, the yeah. social contract. Right. John uh, Milton. Uh, John Locke and so on, because you could see the contradictions of the Enlightenment, which was present and it's real, but you see at the simultaneously that Enlightenment in the Northern Hemisphere was darkness in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, you are immediately experiencing that on a daily basis. Uh, so you don't need to, in essence, as a teenager, to go through the process of consciousness, because your consciousness is there. I have a very good example that might be in, uh, interesting to people in here. Uh, you know, when Nixon was in trouble in this country, and nobody, you know, lying, right. <laughs> lying dick. <laughs> exactly, uh, to Congress. Uh, yeah. To Congress and so on. <laughs> that uh, Nixon went uh, to a tour in the, in the world, right? He went to the foreign policy. So he came to our part of the, uh, of the uh, world. He came to Jordan on a visit. And, you know, when these dignitaries come, they actually, all the schools uh, uh, are gathered. You, you go with your teacher to line up the streets. They paint the street side and so on. And for me, that was a good opportunity to skip class yeah. and go and play soccer. <laughs> <laughs> so when Nixon came to Jordan to clean up his record in here and try to appear presidential, right. I have to say that for me, he was not presidential. <laughs> there was far more important critical thing to score a goal in a soccer game <laughs> was far more important than listening to Nixon. Yeah. And I was also aware of the, what was taking place in Vietnam and uh, you know, the break-in and so on. So I, again, the consciousness formed as yeah. part of the reality that you are living and experiencing, especially that you have all these refugee camps all around Jordan where you right. could see uh, that you are, uh, in essence, a number. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, we fail to recognize that when you're a refugee, you're only regulated by a number, uh, which again points to the contradictions because I know that the suffering of the Jewish community during the Holocaust and the Second World War and how that number becomes how they, how they both are yeah. marked for yeah. the, the genocide and the Holocaust, and now the Palestinians are, in essence, are also regulated through a number. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I guess my question is more about just like, who are some of the figures that influenced your thought in terms of just like, because you do have a, cl a clear picture of just like, uh, um, you know, what colonialism means, and you know, who are some of the scholars that have influenced that view? Well, <laughs> In my early formative years, I was definitely following South Africa almost to the minute details, yeah. uh, both in terms of our historical relations, because as Palestinians, we expressed solidarity with South Africa yeah. for a long period of time. I was following Nelson Mandela's work. I was following uh, uh, Stephen Biko's work. Right. And also was following the uh, here from in the United States, especially the the work of Malcolm X impacted us. Yeah. Uh, he did come and visit Gaza. Uh, people failed to recognize, and some of those who escaped from the United States during the 1960s and early 70s ended up being with us in in uh, the Muslim world. One of the large segments of the Black Panther Party actually escaped and seeked asylum and refuge in Algeria. They also mm -hmm. seek asylum in uh, mm -hmm. Lebanon. Yeah. 
uh, some seek uh, refuge in uh, Egypt. Actually, uh, uh, Everest, Met, uh, Medgar Everest's son uh, mm -hmm. is, is now still in the Middle East. He's in, uh, in the Gulf area, and he left after his father's yeah, assassination. Exactly, exactly. So that's part of our consciousness. These are the stories and the narratives uh, that, that are there. Uh, I remember that the day that Muhammad Ali was uh, having his boxing match yes. with uh, George uh, Foreman. Jo uh, no, with Frazier. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, all I was in Amman. The whole streets were empty. Yeah. So th why? Because uh, for us, Muhammad Ali represented the anti-colonial epistemic coming out from the uh, yeah, bowls right. of the United States. So we identified with him. Right, of course. And he was the, the uh, uh, people's champ because he actually stood to reflect and stand in opposition uh, to the war machine in Vietnam, which we saw its reflection in the, uh, right, uh, in the Arab and Muslim world. So in essence, these are individuals that were, in that sense, you could say, written on our DNA yes. as we're growing up because you are seeing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, what, are, what is taking place, whether it's in South Africa or Vietnam or here in the United yeah, States. And all so those that's examples of just you know, a counter-narrative breaking sure. in and, and disrupting um, you know, a picture of things that, that was very different like 10 or 20 years before. Yeah. Came and as soon as I came to the U.S., I came at age 18 to attend the university, I immediately joined the anti-apartheid movement. Yeah, right. So it wasn't for me just like, oh, do we need to do it? No, I, I joined the anti-apartheid movement, led the movement to, uh, for the boycott uh, movement for South Africa. I led the boycott of Coca-Cola on college campuses. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, have the social responsibility clause that was uh, inserted in many of the campus contracts right. because uh, Coca-Cola was uh, ever present on college campuses. Uh, with the athletics department, and we felt that uh, Coca-Cola was in South Africa, yeah. and it was not the most uh, lucrative uh, company in relation to South Africa, but was the most visible, and there we could actually systematically create localized uh, struggles around Coca-Cola, and then in a short period of time, Pepsi, which was not in South Africa, began to send their RFPs to the campuses with adopting our social responsibility clause and saying we're not in South Africa, right, exactly. which I say mucho gracias that now <laughs> Pepsi is becoming our advertiser for the social responsibility clause. Right. So these are how, uh, you know... Yeah, it's an interesting description of how you just like began to navigate kind of the political sure. situation, and, 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 and I completely remember those days, IBM yeah. and Bank of America and Coca-Cola. And, yeah. uh, and again, you remember the debate, some wanted to go over the military industrial complex. You know, I love to boycott the military industrial complex, but how how often do you buy an M1 tank to your wife? Right, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah, or yeah. you say, you know, honey, for Valentine's Day, I'm going to give you an F-16. Right, right? completely. <laughs> it just, you cannot actually create a rallying political uh, opposition on things that are not directly connected to people who have to make the moral ethical, ish, uh, yeah. ethical position uh, in that stand. But, so in Coca-Cola, you could do that because, again, you have to make the choice whether to take a Coca-Cola bottle from the student store on right. campus right. or you take the Pepsi. So it becomes a localized and almost each individual have to take that moral stand. Yeah, definitely. I wonder just how it felt like for you, because I, I do remember um, being part of those demonstrations in the 80s and just thinking it was just so hopeless, but it ha we had to do it because it was the right thing to do. Uh, how did you feel when, when the, uh, the regime changed so drastically in South Africa? I mean, um, what did that mean to you at the time um, that was all unfolding? Well, I, maybe personally and maybe theologically, I always believe that justice will prevail. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because, again, from theological training, God is the all just. Yes. And even though that the material circumstances in the world will always say that those who are pushing injustice have more resources, right. but you are actually depending on the all just yeah. and all powerful divine. Yeah. So when you, lead, when you lean on the divine, you're leaning on that which is unchangeable, unshakable, no matter what the material circumstances are, yeah, that are there. Definitely. Just think of the liberation theology and Moses right. uh, and Aaron going to Pharaoh. The material dynamics between them is just like they're crazy. Right, exactly. Right? But it's Pharaoh who's a crazy because he did not recognize that the material possessions are meaningless in relation to the, the divine. Life, yeah. So... Uh, colonization, uh, 
will come to an end. And South Africa was the last colonial enterprise in Africa. Mm -hmm. right? If you looked at the world in 1914, 85% of the world's surface was a colony. Yeah. Right? We experienced in the Southern Hemisphere, and as well as the Western Hemisphere, we experienced the world through colonial lens. Mm -hmm. right? uh, it used to be said that uh, the, the British Empire, the sun never sat on the British Empire. Mm -hmm. And I say it's uh, rightly so, because God did not trust them in the dark. Right. <laughs> 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 But what, looking at the success in South Africa, it shows that the old period of colonization, settler colonization, uh, does not have a future. Right. And it's only a matter of changing the cluster of uh, relations, both the material as well as the spiritual, that will bring a new day. And I think the South African apartheid regime realized uh, that their attempt to maintain and keep hold of the structure that they were in was not tenable. Yeah. And I tend to believe the same thing in relations to Israel, that yeah. the attempt to try to maintain a settler colonial project that is structured around uh, expulsion and transfer uh, and building walls to contain people is untenable. Yeah. And therefore, I think the contradictions are increasingly apparent. Uh, uh, yeah, they are. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, too, because I, I, I do see, I mean, um, there are definitely ways in which, um, you know, what's happening now is a reflection of what's been happening for the last century. Yes. Um, but there are also ways in which um, the situation in, in, in Palestine is different. And maybe you can talk about just like African colonialism, Australian colonialism, colonialism mm -hmm. here in North America. And, and how is it that different from what, what, what you see in terms of your, what you call settler colonialism? I think from the, from Indian Individuals who study the uh, phenomena of colonization, and I'm a scholar of both colonization and decolonization, we, have, we are dealing with two different sets of co colonial projects. One is what we call motherland satellite colonization. So again, uh, Britain, uh, uh, France, uh, Belgium, uh, they had a motherland and they took colonies to extract natural resources, uh, direct natural resources to the motherland to be manufactured into finished product and send them back to the colonies and control uh, the markets and the dynamics in there. So that's motherland uh, set, uh, col uh, colonial satellites. Yeah. Uh, the other part is settler colonialism. And uh, the best example, again, of settler colonialism in the United States. States yeah. uh, in settler colonialism, there are two primary features of it. One is genocide toward the indigenous population because you from a settler colonial perspective, you want to replace that population mm. uh, because they, you have no need for them because you're bringing your own settlers to claim the land, claim the territories and so on. And the second, if that's not successful, then you engage in transfer. And therefore, those two elements, if you think of the United States, we have those two that you experience. On the one hand, the native populations were put to genocide. Mm -hmm. And the second, the remaining segments of them are in reservations. Uh, right. uh, so if you think about uh, New Zealand, Australia, Palestine, South Africa was a settler colonial project, and again it came to an end. Yeah. So when often when we deal with Israel, we tend to exceptionalize the normative, meaning that settler colonialism in Israel is no different. There is nothing unique in the settler colonial project that we're experiencing in Israel. Also, more, all settler colonial projects use God as a way to rationalize. That right. why I'm taking your lead, because God told me that. Yeah. And I'm trying to see whether God uses iPhone or the old dial phone. <laughs> right? Again, the use of God manifests destiny, that right. this is divinely inscribed. This is just completely the language and the articulation of settler colonialism, yeah. whether it's, it's spoken within uh, uh, settler colonialism in the New World, in Africa, or in relations to Israel. So I think what we need is to... Uh, uh, remove this exceptional notion that we're dealing with something very unique. Judaism is unique, but settler colonialism is not. It's right. very normative. Right. So, so um, what are what are the differences? But in, I mean, even though it's not totally yeah. unique and sui generis, how how is it you know, different than say you know the, the situation in other? Settler I think the most. The closest example would be the relationship between South Africa and uh, And is it partly Israel. because the numbers of people who are and, involved? So the, and again, the demo demographics are more balanced in terms demographics of Demographics is also one main feature of uh, settler colonialism. There's always a department to deal with demographics. 
again, in our own society, we dealt with it in relation to Native Americans, we dealt with it in relation to the African American community, yeah. you know, in terms of trying to find out uh, and continue the, this element or preoccupation with demographics. In, is, in Palestine today, the, one can say that there was a failure of the settler colonial project in 1948. Mm -hmm. And you could see it in Ben-Gurion when he visited Northern Palestine, he says, what, there's still too many Palestinians in here, why didn't you drive them out? Uh, so, in essence, the project of trying to drive out the Palestinians have failed. Mm. And now it's just a matter of trying to manage and make Palestinian uh, living conditions a living hell that they choose to leave on their own accord. This is what we call the silent ethnic cleansing that is taking place. Mm. But that itself is creating contradiction among the uh, Israeli Jewish population, and increasingly, I would say, that the future of decolonial framing to Palestine is for uh, conscious uh, decolonial Jewish uh, activists and decolonial Palestinian activists to get together and aspire for a different future. Yeah. And I think increasingly is taking place. I think there is very strong activists, both in the United States and Israel, that are beginning to uh, go down that route. I think the work of Jewish Voice for Peace has been very, very critical. Uh, bending the arc is very, very critical, mm -hmm. if not now. So that decolonial future horizon is unfolding. Yeah. Now, everybody was, when is it going to happen? Uh, again, the revolution will not be televised, <laughs> and it's not going to be on Facebook. Yeah. But... I would say those dynamics are taking place in the United States. And again, you look at the data and the statistics that the younger Jewish population is increasingly departing from thinking of Israel and Israel's trajectory as being represented its identities and its future horizon. And I think that shows that uh, settler colonialism has no lasting impact to maintain and keep uh, its uh, firm hold on both the present and the future. And I think I'm very hopeful in this, that the moment will come. Uh, and I think if you look even domestically with the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party is shifting very, very rapidly on the question of Palestine. Mm -hmm. I think it's not surprising that uh, from all of the presidential candidates on the Democratic side, when they were running, uh, only uh, Bloomberg uh, decided to go to APAC. And then when uh, Buttigieg and uh, Klobuchar dropped out, then they decided to go to uh, the uh, uh, APEX conference. So APEC right now is actually, uh, I would say, is losing ground very, very rapidly. Uh, Representative McCollum, who's sponsoring the uh, bill on the rights of the Palestinian children, called APEC, say that they give the stage and airtime for those for bigotry and racism. So again, APAC has shifted from being the uh, king of the hill, being the most powerful lobby in, in Congress, to now a congressman actually uh, uh, standing and saying that they actually are purveyor of uh, hate, discrimination, and bigotry. So they are dealing with a changing, rapid changing dynamics yeah. that we're seeing in front of us here in the United States. And that's the alliance between uh, Palestinians, uh, pro-Palestinians, and young Jewish activists is beginning to make an imprint, and I would say that we're seeing it in front of our eyes. Yeah, you mentioned religion as just being a, 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 like such a pivotal role, and you know, I'm, I remember reading um, Robert Bella's book about you know the Axial Age, and mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, he really describes Palestine as being kind of like the crossroads of the world. I mean, and so it isn't surprising that it's of such religious importance. But maybe you can talk about just you know. A, a, uh, the role of religion in this in this whole picture. Yeah. Well, again, religion is very important. Uh, there is no question that Palestine is a ve very sacred site. Uh, it's not surprising that when we read the prophetic narrative, uh, you know, uh, when we speak about Jesus, it, you know, he was my neighbor. <laughs> right, right, <exactly. laughs> We we'll speak of uh, the prophetic figures in the Old Testament and the New Testament, both in, and the Islamic uh, narrative that Palestine is seeped with religious and sacred meaning. But what we need to be careful about is to use the sacredness of the site to construct a nationalist project that is vested in empire. Mm. And therefore, I always separate between imperial religion and the religion of the people. Mm -hmm. We often tend to think of that God is on our side when we're on top of a tank. Right. and our flag is waving. 
as if like both Jesus, Muhammad, and Moses were part of the military industrial complex. Right. And I think what we need is to be very critical, both of our own understanding of religion and what God is calling upon us, and Palestine being the crossroads of the three Abrahamic religions, and again, without excluding other religious traditions, whether Buddhists, Hindus, and so on, because it seems that we have adopted uh, nationalism and covered it with a flag. And I think this, uh, we have to critique modernity and how modernity have made us begin to think of religion in nationalistic conceptualization. And when you do that, then it's nationalism is structured around differentiation with the other. Mm -hmm. And you begin to think of the purity of blood. Let me tell you, there is no such thing as a purity of blood, right? right? And if you want to think about the purity of blood, the only purity of blood, again, we all originate from Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think some people will think that, whoa, right? So, so again, nationalism begins to get us to think in difference, in exclusion, in building walls, rather than thinking that the, if we have a divine theological imperative, is actually to help the other and welcome the stranger. Right. Nationalism to actually put you to build the walls and put kids in, uh, you know, uh, in enclosures down here. We're talking about we're in the 21st century. We think that we're the most civilized, and we're still building walls and put, taking kids out of their uh, mother arms and put them in uh, a prison cells. Yeah. That, for me, is imperial religion, rationalizing nationalism, and thinking of God basically as a nationalist construct. And I'm glad that you brought that up in, in particular. I, I just wonder if you can talk a little bit more about just America's role in this whole in this whole picture. I mean, um, yeah. it, it, because it just it just seems like there's a, there's a lot of agents and actors. I mean, there's the Palestinians, there's yeah. the Israel's, Israel Israel uh, Israelis, there are the, the the Arab countries in yeah. the, and then there are these imperial powers that have like, that have their own agendas too. And maybe you can help us to kind of separate what the role of each of those different agents in this picture yeah. is. I tend to. Uh, can, uh, at least describe it in the following way. It seems that both the, the uh, Jewish population, the Palestinian population, Muslim population, and other parts of the world, it seems to be all of us are supporting actors in a theater piece yeah. that we are not actors in it. That our role is to bring the tea uh, on stage and exit stage left. And uh, the global north, in particular, uh, for a variety of reasons. One is commitment to a whole millenarian uh, perspective, uh, notion that the return of Jesus was only going to come if we actually established uh, Israel and then get these people to... That is the strangest... Uh, I know, that's it's speculative just, theology, that's but again... so strange to me, but you're right. Yeah. Don't underestimate <laughs> uh, what you call yes. junk science and junk theology right. winning the day. Yeah. <laughs> right? But this is basically junk theology. Yeah. literally, that are the, the foundation of this, and uh, individuals that are committed to try to get Armageddon because they think that Jesus is going to come back when Armageddon and people are in this area. So here the Prince of Peace, yeah. right, the theology of love, is being posited that the only way for Jesus to come back is if this destruction is visited upon. Mm -hmm. Whether Armageddon is going to happen or not, it's none of your business, right, mm -hmm. to actually hasten it. And especially if you're having a contract with the military-industrial complex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in here, theology meets economics, meets military-industrial complex. It's not surprising. Last year, uh, the global world uh, spent about $1.4 trillion on armament. Yeah, Let me repeat this. $1.4 trillion in armament. And I would add maybe another few uh, billions, if not a trillion, on the service debt that is going to buy all these right. uh, death machines. Uh, the UN and Oxfam said we need 20 to $50 billion to address poverty around the globe. Yeah, exactly. Now, the kicker part of it is the That's following. So upsetting. The United States has 55% of the global market on the yeah. selling of weapons. Right. So that, uh, often when people pose the question to me as a Muslim, say, why don't you stop the violence? I say, why don't you stop selling us weapons? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because on the one hand, you can't breach peace while actually you're be being the merchant of uh, weapons, death, and destruction. Especially just think about the last couple of years in terms of the massive sales of weapons into the Middle East, yeah. an area that has been already seeped in blood for the past 30 years. Why would somebody actually add 
armament in there right. and uh, continue to sell weapons in the region. So that gets us into the whole uh, you know, colonial legacy and post-colonialism. Uh, yes, the military uh, colonization have ended, but we're still in a post-colonial phase that the economy, the politics, the military structures, uh, the relationship in the global south is still uh, structured around this, and it ends up being the following. It is about jobs in here. Mm. So in the, during the, actually my lectures last two weeks in my Deconstructing Islamophobia and Otherness, I was looking at the, the history of slavery. Uh, the United States, uh, or before the United States became the country, the colonies needed uh, labor. Mm. And the point of exchange was to sell weapons in order to bring slaves. Right, and right. the more weapons that were sent to uh, West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, the more regional conflict intensified. The more regional conflict intensified, the more slaves were brought because war captives from both yeah, So it's a de fundamentally destabilizing policy. Destabilizing. It was a, an industry or an economy, sla guns for slaves. Yeah. Today, I would argue that we have oil, oil for guns. Mm. You actually get the guns in order to maintain the fossil fuel right. and the, the global economy. And we still don't see it that way because our public relations uh, spokespeople tell us it's the Sunni Shia, Christian, Muslim, uh, Jewish, Muslims, and so on, and begin to be really almost uh, structurally uh, unintelligent and unsophisticated people in, in looking what are the dynamics taking place. So I always tell my students, before you ask what religion or ethnic background the people are, tell me which company extracting which natural resource, that would tell you the type of conflict. Yeah. Right? Uh, in my class, I, I ask, how many of you like chocolate? Yeah. Right? Then you ask the question, what are the best chocolate in the world? Belgium, Belgium Swiss, France, uh, Seas Candy from South San Francisco. <laughs> but, the which is the best. Which is the best, right? <laughs> but the names of the countries that we mentioned in relation to chocolate, yeah. none, none of them have a single cocoa plant. Mm -hmm. And I know you go to France, you could actually have a piece of chocolate that's $16. You want to take a picture next to it. <laughs> but that's a direct result of a long history of extracting yeah. natural resources, bringing it to the global north for, uh, for finishing, and then sending it back. So that's, again, is still with us. I wonder, I mean, it, it's such a compelling picture because yep. you're right, I mean, the armaments, is, it's, it's such a destabilizing force on our time. And it gives but, us meaning to our own society. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, and yet, by the same token, like how much do, I mean, does anyone benefit when the world is destabilized like that? But does that make, I mean, I, to what extent does that make just America just uh, uh, not helpful in, in terms of coming to actual kind of peace agreements? in, in, the, in yeah. those conflicts. I mean, it, does it, 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 do we, is there just like no moral standing for the United States to make any contribution in that setting? Well, again, I think what uh, we need to separate between the United States as a government and as a narrow interest of elite that is responding to the lobbies and what lobbies are there mm -hmm. versus the regular person uh, who sees the contradiction. We still don't have a universal health care. Right, right. We still don't have free education. Yeah. Uh, we still uh, have in San Francisco last it's between eight to twelve thousand homeless. Yeah. Right. Uh, so the people here realize. Like again, uh, you look at the opioid addiction. You know Johnson and Johnson that on the one hand produces uh, medicine and all the nice things for the kids, has been implicated with the long. Uh, uh, engagement with selling opioid, mm -hmm. uh, and over a period of time, I would say they made billions of dollars, and then slap on the hand a 425-475 million dollar fine, and they're going to appeal it. It's going to be reduced by another 100-150 million. So, again, we need to separate between our political system that has become uh, almost the best democracy that money can buy. Mm -hmm and uh, our uh, lobby agencies that maintains that interest uh, in there. So uh, if you think about our military budget uh, and how that is sapping the resources that we have, yeah. right? Uh, MLK, when we had the event oh, in yeah, here, completely. just say, yeah. the bombs that we throw in Vietnam blow up in our inner cities. Yeah. So when we spend $7 trillion since 9-11, 
the result is the homeless that you see on the street. So yeah. we need to make those connections. Right, exactly. Uh, when you are giving these massive contracts to the military industrial complex under the, under the assumption that they're protecting us, I think that has to be challenged. There's a difference between defense of the society versus military industrial complex, which means instrumentalizing our collective abilities and resources to maintain a cluster that at the end of the day they are merchants of death. Mm -hmm. Right? There is no one that could rationalize for me selling weapons to South, uh, to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. There is nobody that could rationalize for me sending weapons to Egypt. There is nobody that could rationalize for me sending weapons and arming uh, Israel at this particular time. So those contradictions in there, in the same way that we dealt with it in Latin America, yeah. whether it's El Salvador and so on. Uh, I was also working with the right, yeah. Haitian yeah. Uh, uh, effort to really alter and change, you know, with, when Father Aristide was elected, yes, yeah. the United States government actually had two coups against him. This mm. is a, a, a father that wanted to eliminate the military. They're an island. They've been subject to the oppression that was being done by, you know, death squads in yeah. there with baby Dag Duvalier and all the uh, struggles of the Haitians. So the United States ends up taking him and sending him into exile. The people mm. rise up and bring him back again, right? So this is a Christian. You don't need to be a Muslim to be actually opposed by the United States. Yeah. If you are for justice, I say if Jesus today in here, he would be locked up. <laughs> right? Yeah. He would be locked up. Moses will be locked up. Right? Uh, Muhammad will be locked up because, again, they say, let my people <laughs> right, right. free and let them go and feed them. Yeah. And in essence, we feed the military industrial complex, we feed the pharmaceutical companies, we feed uh, all uh, the NRA and so on, and we're not feeding the people that are hungry. So there's yeah. a immediate link in yeah. there. And therefore, if they come, again, the United States or Europe, when they say we are going to host a peace conference, run to the hills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've got a few questions just about like how we know about what's happening and just like the information uh, that we get about, uh, you know, what's happening in the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, I wonder just like if you have any suggestions for what news sources we could um, listen to to, to ha have, a, have a, a, a broader picture of, of what's happening or, you know, what yeah. you have to say just about the role of media in, 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 in this whole story. Yeah. One, I will put my, you know, academic <laughs> hat on. Yeah. You always have to look at multiple sources of yeah. information. Uh, you always have to look at local, uh, local news site, you have to regional site and different sites in order for you to correspond the information, which sometimes makes it difficult uh, because not everyone has the time uh, to do so. So you have to look at multiple uh, avenues in order for you to get the information of what is taking place. And I think this goes for almost every issue, not only in Palestine. Every issue that we confront, you have to have multiple sources. The media, unfortunately, no longer does its work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, investigative journalism is no longer uh, undertaken. Like these days, most of what we call journalism is talking heads, right? So you actually get the story, they'll get the uh, report from the, and now you have six people talking heads. Mm -hmm. Their only expertise is they have ability to put the makeup on and they give you the 15 second, what you call, uh, uh, sound bite that is funny. And that's basically, so what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? So for the next hour, and if you think about CNN, Fox, and so on, it's the same format, mm -hmm. and it's cheap, because to have an investigative journalist that goes into the field, that's expense. The story has to develop over a six months period. You have to have fact checkers that go on, get the record. Now you have six people. You, again, you pay them, what is it, $500 a day, and so on, and you have what you call experts. Mm -hmm. And what's your expertise? I, you know, they give a comment about yeah. this place and this place. I was in a, uh, on an interview, and the person who was there as an expert, right, uh, his expertise was he lived six months in the green zone in Iraq. And now he's speaking about democratization, not in Iraq, in the Arab world. Yeah. I said, you know, if that's the criteria, I think we should consult pilots because at least they spend more time, <laughs> right? Because they land, they go to the local Hilton hotel, right. they eat in the surrounding area. They have actually more expertise than you because you stayed in the green zone for six months. You never interacted with other, other than the people that you came yeah, with yeah. and maybe one translator or two that are there. Right. But that becomes the norm of what you call the experts that yeah. we bring, and media bears a major responsibility. Uh, again, as Chomsky said, the role of the media 
is to manufacture consent. Yeah. Uh, and I say that literally that's where we are. They are yeah. manufacturing our it's, consent. I, I'm so glad that you reminded us because we do, we see those and we, and, we, and we do have to be more critical about how we, what we're consuming in terms of... Or Neil Postman, you know, amusing ourselves to death. Yes, right. It's totally a right. Yeah. beautiful, I think yeah. it's a must read. Amusing, it is. I totally amusing agree. ourselves to yeah, death. It's a that. must read because we don't teach media literacy yeah. We don't. I can, one thing is we don't teach people capitalism, right? Even though we're a capitalist society, we actually teach people to work for capitalists, yeah. right? So you could actually graduate from university and not knowing how banks make their money. Yeah. Yeah. And what do they do when you deposit your money in yeah. the bank? Right. It, for a capitalist society, you would think that the first thing we teach you from young yeah. all the way is how to be a capitalist. No, we teach people how to work for capitalists. I'd say that our educational system is training cubicle inhabitants. Cubicle inhabitants. You know, <laughs> I, that's I, what we are. <laughs> <that's, that's laughs> you know, there's been so much change in the media, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about like the new technologies, like uh, internet, um, social media. Yeah. How is that, um, you know, a, a part of this story? Yeah. Uh, let me. <laughs> Where do I begin? <laughs> <Where are you? laughs> the assumption when that new technology emerged. Uh, is that it has created a democratization. And to a certain sense, yes, it created democratization of access. But that access by itself is insufficient because now we're still subject to the behemoth, Facebook, Twitter, yeah. Instagram, and so on. And we know that in the 2016 election, here and on the, also on the Brexit yeah. in the UK, Cambridge Analytica were, were able to penetrate the new technology and actually uh, use targeted uh, uh, ads and targeted material in order to actually cater for you specifically and stoke you into a particular direction of vote. Yeah. So while the democratization and the cost of producing media has shrink, uh, shrunk, uh, I think still we're the big players with the massive resources are influencing what we see uh, what we act upon, and the resources. And I think what we need to figure out is how to make sure that these big behemoths that are controlling the new media uh, are not really shaping another dimension of manufacturing our consent to the continued dispossession of our own yeah. freedoms right. on a local level. And yeah. I think that's is the biggest question that we all have to grapple with. Yeah, and it's really, it's, a, it's an unfolding story yeah. we, I'm, the, that we're not un fully understanding yet. Sure. Um, so one of our um, traditions um, here is we, we take questions on note cards, and Rebecca Nessel collects the questions and then sure. um, gives them to me. Um, what are some concrete actions which could be helpful to the Palestinian people that we could take? Sure. Uh, I think there's a number of things that could be taken. I know that uh, in Alameda, uh, um, uh, uh, Reverend Michael Yoshi, uh, his congregation have adopted a Palestinian village. And what they do is they have an annual program and mobilization. They visit the village, they see what kind of projects that the village needs, and they have adopted the village. And in essence, in here, people-to-people uh, -people relationship are very, very important. So there is that part of it in terms of facilitating those relationships, and I think that's something that we could do on a congregational level and so on. Uh, other in terms of the uh, political dimension, I think there are elements in there in to ask the questions about our relationship with, uh, with Israel and our political positions in there. I am a person that advocates and been part of the PDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction movement, because I, I, my participation in the South African anti-apartheid have demonstrated that this actually a successful strategy, and some of the research for our PDS uh, strategy was developed by the South African activists themselves. So that's again, is a very critical piece uh, of uh, engagement in there. I think from a religious community's perspective, I do think we bear a strong and important responsibility of challenging the speculative theologies that are there. Uh, yeah, so that like m m um, millennialism. Millennialism and so on. And also I would say for Muslims, we also need to challenge, because it seems to be that uh, 
the uh, Super Bowl of end of time scenarios. Yes. It seems to be that people are rotting because it, it appeals to conspiracy theorists. It yeah. appeals to thinking that God is coming as on your side as you shoot people around. Right. Right? So if those people want to be in one room and they compete for it, let yeah. them go in there and let us actually build the healthy yeah. society and in there. Bridges. So I think part of it is that we have to use theological education in a very clear way because that's one of the most dangerous and impactful way once we use uh, theology and uh, uh, rationalize dispossession and rationalize destruction by means of God. And I, I don't think that the loss of meaning for people in relations to religion is, a re is for them losing faith in God, but they're losing faith of those who actually speak for God. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need is to make sure that those who are speaking for God are not actually speaking imperial, speculative theology, millennials, yeah. and thinking that's the way that God wants us to do. I would like to be on the sides of God rather yeah. than asking God to I be on that. my side. I totally agree. There's, um, we have so many questions, we're sure. going to have to like speed it up a little bit. Why have Palestinian Christians, who were once more than 20% of the population, been reduced to less than 2%? Did they leave because of Muslim extremism? Uh, well, uh, I think if you ask... Palestinian Christians, and I have a very, you know, strong relations with Palestinian Christians. Uh, uh, the, for people who are interested in this subject, I think they should read what the Christians in Palestine are saying, Cairo's Palestine, which is the call for Palestinian Christians. The reasons that Christians are leaving Palestine is because of Israel's oppression. Mm -hmm. And that systematic oppression and limitation on their uh, lives that affects them like their Muslim count counterpart brothers and sisters is the main reason that Christians are leaving Palestine. Simultaneously, I would uh, say the following, that tensions between Christians and Muslims has a long history to it, especially within the colonial era. Mm. Uh, part of the colonial dimension, it says that the Western uh, colonial power said that they are there to protect the Christians. And what created this is that it's instrumentalized the local Christian population to drive a particular political epistemic. So part of our work, again, as a Muslim, I'm committed not only to challenging uh, the relationship in the present, but also to re-navigate re history in order for us to draw some lessons. And uh, just in the past few years, uh, we had what you call the common word, which is a document that was signed by almost all, all the Muslim theologians uh, to say that we have a common uh, relationship between Muslims and Christians to deal with the issues. There is the Marrakesh Declaration, which is Muslim theologians representing the broad stroke from Al-Azhar to every, that they're committing themselves to defending Christians in Muslim-majority countries, whether it's in Pakistan or other places, because we actually see the impact of instrumentalizing those relationships. So there are a lot of things that need to be worked. What I don't want is to say that Israel is the protector of the Christian population and the Muslims are the ones that are driving. Muslims and Christians are being driven out of Palestine by Zionism and Israel because it has an exclusivist vision and one way to implement the exclusivist vision is to drive the Palestinians out, Christians or Muslims. When Israeli uh, bulldozers come, they don't ask whether you're Christian or Muslim, they demolish your home because you're Palestinian. Right. Um, sorting out the complex situation among Israelis and Palestinians often gets bogged down in blame. Can you speak um, instead of some consequences of Israeli policy and action, apart from whatever justification might be given for those policies and actions? Well, uh, just this morning before I came, Israel demolished two homes, mm. right? That's a policy that the British began instituting, which that if your family or a member of family is accused of something, they demolish your home. So there is no moral standing for collective punishment to actually uh, demolish a home of an individual. Uh, since, n since 1994, at least from my uh, data, Israel has cut close to a million trees as a part of collective punishment. So, if, uh, meaning that I can understand if you have a, a person that you arrest and you, you charge him for incitement, you file for whatever reason, but I cannot find any rationalization for cutting trees. Mm. And in essence, uh, Israel is systematically using this as a process. Just last week, about 80, 
olive trees have been cut by Israeli settlers with the protection of the Israeli military. So that's again, these are things that are concrete. Uh, the uh, confiscation of uh, Palestinian aquifers, uh, which as a result of building the wall, all the aquifers were actually on this side, and now Palestinians have to buy their water that is stolen from them from the Israeli company. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, I know that when in California, where we actually send our water to Southern, to Southern California, Lab, so I have something to understand this, but this is what the Palestinians, not only that our water is stolen, but actually we have to buy, to buy it back from uh, Israel. Uh, the checkpoints, over 480 checkpoints on, on the West Bank. Uh, you know, it took me about 20 minutes, 25 minutes to drive from Berkeley in here. Palestinian uh, who wants to go from one place to the other, you have to actually plan for five, six hours just to get from one place to the other. So you might actually between, if you're from, let's say, Ramallah to go to Nablus, sometimes it might take you four to five to six hours just to cross a 30 mile to 40 mile uh, distance yeah. uh, just because you have to go through a checkpoint. Uh, so these are, again, the realities of the Palestinians that we're, what we're facing. Is there, that's a great answer to the question. Is there in Jerusalem today a school where Palestinian and Jewish students can learn and discuss alternatives to the current um, situation and dream? Well, the, uh, I said earlier that there are Palestinians and Jewish activists that are working and attempting to think post-Zionism and post-colonization, and that is taking place on a grassroots level. I want to be very careful of not to, because Israel also is working in a counter what you call measures, so they create what I consider to be these public relations uh, efforts, will come and visit and see how Palestinians and Jews laugh together, but laughing together under an apartheid system. Uh, there are Palestinians and Jews that are working together, but they're not managed through a variety of initiatives that the Israeli government is instituting as a way to try to eliminate or remove the criticism of its heavy structure of colonization that is there. Uh, and similarly, in here in the United States, there are many programs uh, that are bringing Muslims, uh, Christians, Jews together in challenging the narrative and challenging the possibilities of the present and in the future. Here's a question. Um, um, uh, thank you. Um, and Article 17 and 18 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights um, are about the freedom of religion, thought, expression, etc. Islamic law is Islamic law similar or different to the, to the to that kind of impulse? Uh, actually, it's a great question because uh, again, what we need is to be aware that looking at media coverage of ISIS, that does not represent normative Islam or normative Islamic history. Mm -hmm. So we tend to think of Islam and Muslim history through the contemporary articulations of these uh, organizations. I would say Islamic law, as well as historical development of Islamic law, it guarantees freedom of religion. Uh, that's why uh, I'm, if you think the oldest Christian communities in the world are not in Rome. Mm -hmm. They're in Palestine, they're in Iraq, they're in Egypt, they're in Yemen, they're in Turkey, and they have existed even during the period of tension what we call the Crusades, which was Christian attempts to try to put the Western imprint of Christianity on the East, and it failed. Mm -hmm. So what we need is to understand that dynamic. That doesn't mean that communities that are contending with each other in a nationalistic conceptions, they don't get the tension, and that's why I always aware. Are you bringing to the table a nationalist construction and a, adopting modernity and adopting a capitalism, or are you speaking theologically and understanding what is taking place? So that's part of the navigation uh, that are there, uh, and I think, again, I'm a specialist in Islamic law, and I would say that the articulation of Islamic law in terms of the religious freedoms are paramount. Lastly, I would say the following. When uh, the Spanish Inquisition was put in place, uh, the Jewish population was given refuge in, uh, the, in the Ottoman territories. Uh, and that uh, uh, relationships that you find in North Africa and in, uh, uh, in Turkey today is those communities that actually were expelled during the Inquisition period. During the summer, I usually take my students both to Grenada and France. In Grenada, we have the Inquisition Museum that was set up by the Jewish community in Grenada. Mm -hmm. And to actually look, long, look at the long history of the Inquisition, in 
Uh, in France, I take my students to actually deal with the current immigration and refugee crisis, and I take them specifically to the uh, Grand Mosque in, uh, in Paris. Mm -hmm. The Grand Mosque in Paris was a gift from the French government to the Muslims who fought on the side of the French during World War I. Uh, and it's a gift. It was built in the Moroccan style. So on. During the Second World War, the Imam of the Mosque is accredited for saving the lives of 700 to 1,000 Jews mm -hmm. who came to him, and he used to give them uh, ID card that they're Muslims and hide them within the mosque. Mm -hmm. One of the most famous singers in France at the time was uh, uh, by the name of Hilali, who was very famous. He's of uh, Jewish background from uh, North Africa. So uh, he came to the Imam to ask for a certificate. So the Imam gave him a certificate that he's a Muslim. But actually the Imam also went ahead and sent one of the assistants to the graveyard, the Muslim graveyard, to erase one of the headstones and write uh, Hilali's father's name in there in case the German arrest him. He could say, I'm a Muslim, and I'll show you where my yeah, so uh, is father is buried. And sure enough, the Germans arrested him. And he said, no, I'm a Muslim, and my father is buried in the cemetery. So the German uh, mm -hmm. army went in there. And sure enough, he is, his father said, so they let him go. Uh, he lived until 1974 wow. uh, or 75. And every time he speaks, he said, I was saved by the Imam of the, mos of the mosque in yeah. Paris. And the French government does an annual ceremony because the Imam is buried in the mosque because the French government during the Second World War was cooperating with the Nazis. Right. And here is the Muslim Imam who was actually putting himself and the congregation in the middle of Paris yeah. under threat. Uh, he was actually engaged in saving Jews. Moving forward, now Marie Le Pen from the uh, right-wing neo-Nazi party says that the Muslims don't belong in France. Now this is her father who's a neo-Nazi. His hobby is to collect Nazi memorabilia. Yeah. She has the audacity to say to the Muslims in France that they don't, don't belong in there, yeah, yeah. while she is, uh, uh, you know, beholden to a Nazi, neo-Nazi ideas. Uh, she thinks she represents uh, humanistic values, and right. I'm trying to say, where were they? Yeah. Uh, and the only country in Europe where the percentage of Jews increased during the Second War is Albania, the Muslim country. Right. right. Right? So this is the history in, in actual, what you call, unfolding day to day. Yeah. But instrumentalizing that Muslims are the other feeds into uh, getting people to be uh, hyped up and support yeah. death machines and death economies and death and destruction. And I think that's what we need to re-counter and recreate the narrative to show a longer history and longer durée. Otherwise, we fall into these dynamics. Yes, exactly. You've had so much to say, and I have so many more questions for you. I wish I could just keep you for the rest of the day. Well, I know you have to go I, and do the I do sermons, want to but. talk to you about um, just you know the, the, um, the, the administration's peace proposal in January. There are just a lot of things that yeah. we didn't get a chance to cover. We'll have to ha have you come back again. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a peace proposal. It's an IPO a for Palestine. A proposal. <laughs> an IPO. <laughs> All right. Um, I want uh, wanted to um, let you all know that next week we're going to be talking to Joan Williams. She's a, the legal scholar and author of What Works for Women at Work and White mm. Working Class. And she'll be talking about bridging differences in gender, class, race, and work. Um, you're also, of course, welcome to or, um, join us for the 11 o'clock service upstairs. Um, and if you get a chance, we'd love it if you could um, like leave a gift for us, too, on your way out. And um, s thank you so much to Hatem Basian, um, a, a professor and a, a dedicated to bridge building across the... Thank you. Thank you very much for thank being you. here. Thank you.